All right, good evening, everybody. We are going to talk about DNA, and in particular, we're going to be talking about DNA replication. I've been having some trouble with my videos tonight, so it's possible that I'll freeze. This video will freeze, and if it does, we'll just keep going and not worry about the frozen video. All right, so what I want to do really quickly is just refresh our memory. We learned a little bit about DNA and the structure of DNA back in our biochemistry unit. Um, so before we talk about replication, let's just refresh your memory on a few things. So remember that DNA has... Um, um, a similar molecule that's called RNA. DNA is double-stranded, so it's got two sides of it, whereas RNA is just single-sided. DNA has nitrogen bases that are called um, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, um, and we just abbreviate them A, G, C, and T. Um, RNA has very similar nitrogen bases, but um, it has uracil instead of thymine. They both are important for, well, in particular, DNA stores our hereditary information, whereas the RNA is going to carry that information out to the ribosomes to tell us what, what proteins to build. Um, and then the sugar involved in DNA, the name DNA is deoxyribo nucleic acid. So this whole thing is a nucleic acid, um, and deoxyribose is the name of the sugar. And in RNA, the sugar's name is ribose, and that's ribonucleic acid. All right, so the part that's going to be, the reason I wanted to review this in particular is there's always lots of student frustration over the phrases five prime end, there it is, and three prime end, which is on the other side. I'll make this go away here. Um, the five prime end is referring to which carbon the phosphate is attached to. So let me just refresh your memory. So this is just sort of a, a molecule. It could be RNA right now. Um, and they're showing you the monomers. The monomers are the building blocks of DNA or RNA in this case, and they're called nucleotides. So a nucleotide is a phosphate, one of the five-sided sugars, and then one of the nitrogen bases. Um, you, you may also see the word nucleoside, and that's just the sugar and the, the base and with, without the phosphate group. Okay, so where do the name five prime and three prime come from? It has to do with which sugar, nope, which carbon they're attached to on the sugar. So let's take a look at the sugar. The first carbon in the ring is attached to one of the nitrogen bases. So it has the name one prime carbon. So here's the second carbon. Here's the third carbon. That becomes important in a moment. Here's the fourth carbon. And then the fifth carbon actually sticks up above the ring structure. And that's what the phosphate group is attached to. So as we look at this side, let's say this is a DNA molecule. It's only one-sided at the moment, but we look here, we see the phosphate is attached to the fifth carbon. And so we refer to this end that has the phosphate sticking up. We call that the five prime end. It's referring to the fifth carbon. On the opposite end, you see that there is a hydroxide group attached to the third carbon of the pentose sugar. And so the other end of the molecule is referred to as the three prime molecule. Um, I'm just telling you that that is going to be a source of frustration for many of you. So just um, that's what it's referencing is which carbon it's attached to. All right. And then just to remind you here, here's another image of a nucleotide. It's got a phosphate, the five carbon sugar, and a nitrogen base. Um, adenine is always across from thymine in DNA, and guanine is always across from cytosine. Um, and then there's uh, molecules that are called purines and pyrimidines. The nitrogen bases are purines or pyrimidines. Um, adenine and guanine have two rings. We're going to see them in the next slide. Um, whereas the pyrimidines, cytosine, thymine, and uracil have one ring. And so I'll show you those right here. Um, these are the pyrimidines. They just have the one ring. I always remember it because the word pyrimidine has a Y in it, and so does cytosine and thymine. Helps me remember. Uracil doesn't. It doesn't fit. Whatever. Um, adenine and guanine are the purines, and they have two rings. And then this is what the, um, the two different sugars look like. They're very, very similar. Notice the hydroxide group here that's not present in the other one. And I think, yep, that's all we need to know on that part. Now, this is where my video froze last time, so we'll see what happens. See if my video is going to survive or not. Uh, maybe, maybe it's going to work. Let's try. So now we're going to switch to the Prezi and we'll see if it can survive all of this. It's just too much work. All these open tabs and everything is just too much for my computer. Hey, the video is working. 
All right. So the central dogma, ooh, it just sounds so important and impressive. And it actually is really important and impressive. And that's what we're going to talk about. So questions we're looking at, how is the structure of DNA related to its function? How does DNA allow for heritability? How does DNA allow for traits in an organism? And how do mutations affect DNA structure and function. We're going to look at all of that during this Prezi, but we're not going to, this video is only going to cover the first section, which is on replication. So this central dogma, what are we talking about? So once the structure of DNA was determined, Watson and Crick are the scientists that got credit um, and won the Nobel Prize. They were using um, several other scientists' research, including um, Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins, um, but they are the ones that were given the Nobel Prize for really determining the structure of the DNA molecule. So then they had to figure out how it worked. So the central dogma is a phrase that was coined by um, Francis Crick, who was one of the discoverers of the um, DNA model. And he referred to how information, the central dogma refers to how information flows in cells. So the idea is that it starts in the DNA, that information is transferred to a molecule of RNA, which then gets transferred and um, deciphered into a protein. And then the protein is sort of the, the ultimate of what the DNA was trying to get us to do. I don't know if that made any sense. It was awkward. Okay, moving on. So DNA, the first thing that we want to talk about is replication. How does the DNA replicate itself? So we've already learned in mitosis and in meiosis that during the S phase, monovalent chromosomes become bivalent chromosomes. We have two sister chromatids and they should be identical to one another. I told you that this is a source of lots of mutations, not lots, but some mutations. Um, and so now we're going to take a look at um, how does it happen and where are those, where, what happens with those mutations. So let's go ahead and refer back here. So it says, it's easy to see how DNA is copied by looking at its structure. So I'm going to cut right to the chase, and then I'm going to back up and give you a little bit more details. But this, let's say, is the original DNA molecule. And I, I like that they stick in this Prezi with um, certain colors. So the dark blue is going to be the parent DNA. The um, A's are always crossed from T's and C's and G's. And then notice these little gaps that are between them. Those represent hydrogen bonds. There are hydrogen bonds that are attaching the two sides of the DNA molecule, and they're very weak. So the DNA molecule can actually unzip, the two sides can unzip from each other. Now, I will also add that the bonds that hold um, the sugar phosphate backbone together, those are covalent bonds and they're super strong. So those bonds never come apart, but the bonds holding the A's, T's, C's, and G's, they're super, super weak. And so they can separate. So here the two sides separate from each other. And then the cell just copies one side and it copies the other side. So notice that on one side you have old DNA and the other side you have new DNA and then new DNA and old DNA. And now compare the two sides and notice AT, AT, CG, CG. We have just made identical copies of DNA. Now let's bring that back into what you already know. These two, now we're looking at just the molecular level here, but they represent the sister chromatids. So this is one monovalent and the other monovalent. These two are the copies of each other. Um, and then when the cell divides, it'll divide right between them. And one of these will go to, to the cell on the left and one of these will go to the cell on the right. All right. Um, so we refer to that as semi-conservative replication. Now, the question is, how did they prove that it was called semi-conservative replication? Because this is so incredibly difficult to observe. The, um, the experiments that were done in this unit in particular are so ingenious. And I hope that you can see the beauty in these experiments um, because it, they're just so creative where we can't see the molecules, but we can still deduce what was going on in the molecules. So there were three possible hypotheses about how DNA was copying itself. The first one is called semi-conservative, and I'm going to cut to the chase and tell you that was the right answer. So semi-conservative just means that the hydrogen bonds break, the two copies, the two sides separate. And then, so in this case, we have the dark um, the dark side is the dark side. Ooh. The dark side is the old DNA. And then the light side is the new DNA. So semi-conservative means that one side is always conserved and the other side is brand new. So it's not completely conserved. 
it's just semi-conservative. Now, another hypothesis of how DNA copied itself was called conservative. This idea was that the entire old DNA molecule gets copied in its entirety um, into a new DNA molecule. So notice both sides are new here and both sides are old there. The third um, hypothesis was called dispersive, and that was the idea that some sections would be old DNA and then some sections would be new DNA and so forth and, and back and forth on the two so that they were copying each other, but there was a little bit of each. So now they needed to be able to prove it. Meselson and Stahl are um, the scientists that conducted an experiment in 1958 that are we're going to show you in just a second. And it has sometimes been referred to as the most beautiful experiment in biology. And there are many cool experiments in biology. This one's pretty good. So this is what they did. And, and I'm going to see if I can explain it. Um, and it's going to just, I want you to let your brain sink in and try to understand it. This is absolutely a question that they could ask in an AP um, exam, like one of the scenarios. Um, and it's just such a brilliant experiment. So they started out, let's see if I can explain it well, this is tough. They started out by putting bacteria into a, a culture, a medium, a growth, something that has nutrients in it where the bacteria can grow. And it contained um, nitrogen that's called heavy nitrogen. It's an isotope of nitrogen. It's nitrogen 15. And most nitrogen are nitrogen 14. So if you see step number two refers to nitrogen 14, the difference between 15 and 14, they have the same number number of protons and electrons that's required for the protons is required for it to still be nitrogen. But the number of neutrons is different. Each um, neutron has a mass of one. And so this 15, nitrogen 15 has an extra, nit an extra neutron, which makes it a teeny bit heavier. We, we say it's mass, not weight, but regardless, it makes it a little bit heavier. So they grew the bacteria in this original culture that had all this heavy nitrogen. Now keep in mind that DNA is full of nitrogen. That's what the nitrogen bases are, A, T, C, and G. So they're incorporating, these bacteria are incorporating the heavy nitrogen in their DNA. So then they take an original culture, um, a section of this, put it into a test tube, and they, I'm not going to go into all the details, but basically they kill some of the bacteria. They add um, a chemical that breaks their cell walls and allows them to break open and spill out their DNA. And then they take this test tube of dead bacteria and DNA, and they put it in a centrifuge. And the centrifuge spins it. Heavy things sink to the bottom, light things float to the top. So when we start out the first test tube, and there, here's examples of test tubes, the first test tube for this generation that was right here produces a band at the that's a fairly low level in the test tube, and that's because it has the heavy nitrogen. So if you look at this diagram down here, I'm going to see if I can get closer to this diagram here, move it up a little bit. So if you look at this diagram, the line down here is represented by the heavy nitrogen, N15. The line that's up higher is the mass that you would expect for if it had nitrogen 14 incorporated into the DNA molecule. Okay, give me a second. So then they transfer, let's bring it back. Then they transferred the bacteria to a new culture that had nitrogen 14, and they allowed the DNA, they allowed the cells to replicate one time. So bacteria replicate approximately every 20 minutes. So after 20 minutes, they remove some of the bacteria. They add a chemical that breaks open their cells, so it kills the bacteria, and they spew out their DNA. Now, the DNA has been copied one time, but it's been copied now with light nitrogen instead of the heavy nitrogen. So they spin it in the, um, in the centrifuge again, and then they look at um, they look at what pattern forms after that first spin. So after this first spin, and they show it down here also, we get a band, a, a bunch of DNA that collects in the middle of the test tube, and it's higher than the DNA from the first um, test tube. And so what is the implication? Well, let me show you what the implication is, sort of. It, that first time, that first spinning gives us a hint. So let me back up and show you. If, give me a second to remember which one it is. Um, all of a sudden, I'm forgetting. Oh, right, I know, I know which one it is. Um, right away, we can cancel one of the hypotheses. If the DNA, when it gets copied, 
if one strand of DNA is heavy and one strand of DNA is light, then we should have gotten two bands of DNA in that test tube. Some that contain the heavy nitrogen and I'm sorry, one band that contains the heavy nitrogen and one band that contains the light nitrogen. But that's not what they saw. They saw a band that contains medium nitrogen. It's a combination of, um, of light nitrogen and heavy nitrogen. It's in between the 14 and the 15. Well, how is that possible? Well, the two of the hypotheses actually say that's possible. If every DNA strand includes some old DNA that has nitrogen 15 and some new DNA that has nitrogen 14, then the average mass here is gonna be about 14.5. Whereas this one, the mass is 15 and 14. And then this one, so this one, it cannot be. We've already canceled that out immediately. This one here, the mass, these are all 15s, then these are all 14s, then this is 15, and vice versa. These are all 14s, this is 15s. So this one also produces one band that is a hybrid in between the two, so a 14.5. So let's scooch ahead. So what we see is this hybrid, oops, went too close. We see this hybrid line, one line in the test tube. I'm trying to get myself out of the way. There we go. That is in between nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 15. So it's implying that the DNA molecules after that first replication are made of some nitrogen 14 and some nitrogen 15 that they've combined. All right, so now they're gonna do it again. Let me get out a little bit further here. Let's see if I can go the right way, sorry. Okay, so then they do it again. They allow the bacteria to replicate again, and they um, pull some out. They add a chemical to break them open. They let the DNA spew out, and they spin it in a centrifuge again. And this time, with the next generation, so this is the second replication, um, we got two different bands. We have a light band that's nitrogen 14. That means that all of the DNA has just nitrogen 14 in it. And then we have a band that's in the middle that is a combination with some nitrogen 14 and some nitrogen 15. So which of the two hypotheses that are remaining did that support? Let's take a look. So let's go on, oops, go on one more and see if we can show this. Okay, the one that we already eliminated was the conservative model because um, if it has an entirely heavy strand of DNA and an entirely light strand of DNA, it should have produced two bands of DNA in the test tube. But in that first um, spinning of the test tube after the first replication, um, it only had one band in the middle in between 14 and, and 15. So we knew right away it couldn't be this one. So now it could have been either of these. Here's the band in the middle that is a combination of 14 and 15. So this one might be the correct hypothesis. And this one, notice the light blue stands for new DNA and the dark blue stands for old DNA. It's a combination of old and new um, nitrogen. And so it produces a band in the middle also. But now we let it copy again. And this is what we end up with. So I want you to follow this. Here's, oops, went too close. These prezies are such a pain in the butt sometimes. Okay, so if we're gonna copy this particular DNA molecule, let's look at the old DNA. If we copy the old DNA, this, this side right here, the dark blue side, it's gonna have a light blue side. So we're gonna have a new DNA molecule that's half dark blue and half light blue. But what if we now copy the light blue side? The light blue side has the light nitrogen and it's going to be copied with light nitrogen because that's what it's in. That's the medium that we're soaking in. We don't have any more um, heavy nitrogen available. So both strands are going to be light. So that should produce a lighter weight um, set of DNA molecules. You still have this medium weight DNA molecules that are, are heavy and light combined, but then you're going to have some DNA molecules, let's see if it shows it, some DNA molecules that are totally lightweight, and then a couple that have um, both of them combined. And what did it look like under when we spun them down? It looked like this. So let's go back and see, and it did not look like this one. So let me go back. 
Here are the two layers. There's one, there are some DNA molecules that are entirely light nitrogen, and there are some DNA molecules that have um, some of the heavy nitrogen and some of the light nitrogen. And so they proved that um, DNA is semi-conservative in its replication. Were you able to follow that one? That one's pretty complicated. All right, so let's talk about exactly about how replication happens. When I teach this in regular biology, basically what I say is um, the DNA, okay, so imagine my arms are a DNA double helix. So the DNA untwists, it unzips, and then one side of the DNA gets copied by um, a molecule called uh, an enzyme called DNA polymerase. And then the other side gets copied going the other direction by DNA polymerase. The two sides separate, the cell divides, and we have DNA replication. We've copied them. Okay, so that's the regular biology version. Now, it turns out it's a lot more complicated than that. So there are three main steps. We call them initiation, elongation, and termination. Um, I am going to have you watch a video of this entire process. It is extremely difficult to explain this in still photos. Um, and we have a video that you're going to actually add the narration to that will um, make it a lot better than what I can do. But I'm going to give you sort of an introduction. So you're going to hear it from me. You're going to read it in your textbook. You're going to write about it in your notes or in your active reading guides. You're going to watch the video and then you're going to narrate the video. And by the fifth time around, you will understand how DNA replication works. But let's let's start with this. All right. So to initiate, it means to start DNA replication. What's starting replication? So it says replication can only be give, begin at specific locations or origins on the chromosome. Once it begins, replication proceeds in two directions. So if this is the origin, replication goes this way and works that way. So if we look, there are two different types of chromosomes that we're going to be talking about. Prokaryotes have circular DNA. Eukaryotes have what's called linear DNA. So the way in which it works is a little bit um, complicated. The, um, there's going to be a phrase that we call the replication bubble. So the DNA opens up and then it starts copying this way. So it going in opposite directions and it leads to a section that looks like a little bubble. You can see the bubble here. Um, so this strand, this like long, twisty, snotty thing, I don't know, that's a DNA molecule. And notice there's a bubble here in it. So there's like a loop in it, like a circle. And there's another bubble right here in it. That is the DNA that has separated. So like right in this section, the DNA is all twisted up. So it's like this. But then in this section, the DNA has done this and it's separated. And so you have these replication bubbles. DNA is being, um, it's untwisting and unzipping and opening going this direction. And it's untwisting and unzipping going this direction. And that's what those um, arrows are implying. This will start to make sense. The more you see it, it will start to make sense. So in a prokaryote, this is what we see on the left. This is their circular DNA. They have one point of origin. It starts, it starts to open and add. As it opens, the dark blue is the old DNA and the light blue is the new DNA. And it starts copying like this. So the replication bubble starts getting larger as the DNA starts untwisting and unzipping and the, the, the A's, T's, C's, and G's start separating from each other. And the DNA gets copied. More and more and more of the DNA gets copied until you end up with two um, circular identical chromosomes. So that's in a prokaryote. In a eukaryote, which tends to be way more DNA than what we have in prokaryotes, we have multiple sources or multiple origins of replication. So it starts copying in numerous places all at the same time. So we get lots of replication bubbles that they're going the, they're going opposite directions. And eventually this one going this way will collide with this one going this way. And you will have replicated the entire thing, which is what you see down here. Now, oops, went too close again. Um, you see the old DNA across the top and then the new DNA right next to it. And then the new DNA and then the old DNA. So again, this blue, dark blue and light blue and light blue and dark blue, that represents the two sides of a bivalent chromosome. So then eventually we're going to separate them and the cell's going to divide. And these two guys are going to go in one cell. That's the DNA of one cell. And this is an identical copy of the DNA that's going to go in the other cell. So we basically cloned the DNA so that the cell can divide. 
All right, next. So these are, um, this section is introducing you to some of the super important enzymes. Um, remember that enzymes are proteins and their job is to either put molecules together or pull molecules apart. And they almost always are named with an ASE ending. So these are the ones that you really need to know. And I'll tell you when you do or don't need to know the name of an enzyme. DNA polymerase, absolutely. DNA polymerase is the one that reads one side of the DNA so if there's an A, it adds a T. If there's a C, it adds a G. That's DNA polymerase's job, which we're going to talk about in a minute. It's not yet. Helicase, actually, I'm going to say topoisomerase. I don't, these must be in, yeah, these are in alphabetical order, not necessarily in the order they occur in this process. So topoisomerase is right here. Topoisomerase's job is to untwist the DNA. So when it's all twisted up, we can't do this process. So it untwists the DNA. Then helicase unzips the DNA. It separates the two sides from each other. Um, and then I will just mention, um, I don't know if you need to know these or not, but the single strand binding proteins, they are there, they attach because the two sides of DNA are attracted to each other. So when we unzip them, they have a tendency to zip right back up again. So we put things in the way so that they can't get back together again. And that's the single strand binding proteins. It just prevents them from re-annealing is the word. All right, so the first enzyme that really takes action now is called primase. Um, it's basically, hmm, it lays down the first section of A's, U's, C's, and G's. It's called an RNA primer. And it's basically telling the DNA polymerase, this is where you start. So the DNA polymerase, we haven't seen it yet, but that's it's going to start after this RNA primer. All right, I think I've given you the introduction. And so that is called... Um, and here it is again, um, and this is called initiation. So this is the beginning of um, replication. A couple things, you don't need to know this word autocatalytic. Um, um, nucleotides are automatically added. Okay, here's why I introduced you to three prime and five prime, because this makes people wanna cry. It's not that hard, but um, nucleotides are automatically added to the three prime end of the DNA strand. Let's look at it. Here's the original, they call that the template strand. That's the parental DNA the original DNA. It's called the template strand. And again, they've made it dark blue. I love when they keep it the, the same colors. So notice that the new DNA is being added to the three prime end. Here's the three prime end of the template. Um, this means that DNA replication can only occur into the five prime to three prime direction. What, KJ, didn't you just say the three prime? This is confusing. So DNA is anti-parallel. So I always show this with my arms. This is parallel. This is, can I get it in the camera? This is anti-parallel. Notice my arms are going in opposite directions. They're still not running into each other, but they're upside down from each other. So look carefully at the two sides of DNA. The three prime end is on the top here and the five prime end is on the bottom. Notice the new DNA, it's flipped upside down. The five prime end is on the top and the three prime end is on the bottom. So when the DNA, the new side of the DNA is being made, it always, always, and this is gonna be a problem, always has to be made five prime to three prime. That's the direction that it travels. It's like these are one way roads and you can only go one direction and you break the law if you go the wrong direction. Let me explain in just a minute. So, and this will all start to make sense as we go. Um, and then not important, but here's a triphosphate and then we drop off two of the phosphates and then you just have the one phosphate that joins to make that phosphate sugar backbone. Okay, so now we get to the part where we're actually replicating the DNA. It's called elongation. The last part is termination, just kind of wrapping it all up. Okay, so elongation. The first thing it says, nucleotides, that's the phosphate, sugar, and A, T, C, or G, are added to the new strand of DNA in the five prime to three prime direction. There is an issue because DNA is anti-parallel, because it looks like this. This is going to be a problem, and this is where the video is way better than I can be. As the replication machinery moves along the chromosome, only one strand of DNA, which we call the leading strand, can be made in a continuous 
five prime to three prime piece. So let's take a look at that happening here. So here's, um, here's the big image. The DNA is getting copied. One of them is going in this direction and one of them is going in this direction because it's anti-parallel. Something happened to my video. I don't know what happened. I'm just not going to worry about it. All right, so let's break it down. Um, this little, what looks like a zipper, those are the A's, T's, C's, and G's. Um, topoisomerase is untwisting it, and helicase, this green blob, that's helicase, is unzipping it. The RNA primase has already been through. It's not on this image, and it laid down what is called the RNA primer. Now, don't worry about sliding clamp. That is That one is not one, an enzyme you'll have to know. Now the DNA polymerase clumps up, clamps on, that's not a word. It attaches on, <laughs> clamps on, I think is what I was looking for. <laughs> it attaches and it starts reading the DNA. When it sees a C, it's going to add a G. When it sees a T, it's going to add an A. When it sees an A, it's going to add a T. And it's moving at incredible speed. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So basically, as fast as helicase can unzip, this helicase is moving this direction. So as fast as it can unzip, the DNA polymerase is right behind it, adding A's, T's, C's, and G's at a mind-blowing speed. So that one's really easy. And we call that the leading strand. So here's the leading strand. It's made continuously is the way we say it. Super fast. All right. It is the other side the other side of the DNA. So here it's, um, let's see if I, this, this side here that's running in the opposite direction because it's anti-parallel, we call that the lagging strand and they reference the leading strand and the lagging strand. The lagging strand is gonna be a problem and let's see if I can explain it well enough. So it says the other strand, the lagging strand has to be made in smaller discontinuous five prime to three prime segments that are called Okazaki fragments, which are then stitched together by the enzyme ligase. What? You're like, okay, so the, in this one, it's going the opposite direction. In the last thing that we looked at, the last image we looked at, the DNA was being formed in this direction. This one, it has to go in the opposite direction because it's a one-way road. So here's the DNA primase, here's the DNA polymerase, and it's copying and copying and copying and copying until it gets to the end or it gets to another section that has already been copied, but it basically hits a roadblock and it's done and it falls off. So here is the DNA polymerase falling off. It has made a little section and then it fell off. Um, in the meantime, when it's traveling this direction, the DNA helicase, which they are not showing you on this image, is opening more of the DNA. It's unzipping more of the DNA. So now we can back up and have a new DNA polymerase clamp on maybe right here and work from here, going, 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 oh, until it runs into this primer and then it falls off. So they're showing that here, right here. So a primer was added. Here's the DNA polymerase. It goes until blam, it runs into a primer and then it falls off. And so now what we have is this first section that was formed. And now we have the second section that was formed. And in the meantime, topoisomerase and helicase are untwisting and unzipping the DNA. So a new DNA polymerase comes in and copies that section up to this section. And so it keeps getting formed in these little sections that are called Okazaki fragments. And then finally, a molecule called DNA ligase. Actually, I think this one's supposed to be ligase. DNA ligase um, sews the, them together. Remember that they are made, um, the backbone has covalent bonds in it. And right now, if we look at it up close, you can see that there's a break in between the two fragments, the two Okazaki fragments, there's a break. So this molecule called um, ligase, its job is just to form a covalent behind, bond between them so they don't fall apart. So these, um, the backbones don't fall apart. All right, so that's elongation, and I am here to tell you that, there we go, I'm here to tell you that the video does a much better job than I'm able to do. So let's look at it again. Here's the leading strand along the top, and top and bottom are irrelevant. This is a three-dimensional molecule. It could rotate any way. So just in the diagram, it's on the top, but in the di next diagram, it, the leading strand could be on the bottom. So on this one, it's moving continuously this direction and it's forming in the five prime to three prime direction. 
But this one, the first section is formed here, the second section formed here, the third section formed here, the fourth section is about to form to here, the fifth section hasn't even started yet. Those are the Okazaki fragments, and you can see DNA ligase joining them together. All right, and this is, I'm not gonna go into this, just be aware that um, it has kind of a complicated structure and there's some proteins that hold them together and fold them all up. You don't need to worry about that right now. I don't like this video, it's too complicated. The one that I have for you, that's the video that you're gonna like. Okay, the very last step, this is where things get really, I think, crazy and interesting, but um, it's called termination. Um, elongation, let me get my picture out of the way. Elongation continues until replication bubbles merge, which is perfect. However, the ends of linear eukaryotic chromosomes pose a unique challenge. Each round of replication shortens the five prime end of the lagging strand by about 100 to 200 base pairs. So without going into the details, just take a look at this diagram. We have RNA, this is the end of the chromosome, the, the end of a linear chromosome. We have RNA primer, but this never gets replicated. This end never gets replicated because RNA polymerase needs, I'm sorry, DNA polymerase needs another primer and there's no other primer. So it never comes in and copies that end. So just trust me. That's all. You don't need to know exactly how it works. You just need to trust me that every time our DNA gets copied, the tips of the DNA get a little bit shorter and a little bit shorter. That's a problem because DNA is DNA. And if we start, you know, our, start losing some of our base pairs, that leads to problems in our DNA. So eukaryotic DNA has these little protective tips on the ends of chromosomes. Um, I've heard scientists refer to them like the, are they called aglets, I think? The plastic tips on the ends of your um, shoelaces. Those protective tips on the ends of your shoelaces, what happens if those break or something damages them? Then the shoelace frays, right? So those protective tips are uh, on a chromosome are called telomeres. And it's their job to protect the chromosome that's on the inside and make sure that DNA never gets damaged. So what happens is the telomeres get shorter with every single cell division and their DNA doesn't matter. They are not important. There's no important genes carried in the, tel in the telomeres. So it's okay that they get shorter and shorter and shorter until they get too short. And then the cell enters senescence. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why we get old. It is because our telomeres get too short. And if they, if the cell were to continue cell division, then we would actually start damaging our DNA. So the cell says no more. Now that's why we get old. Here's a bunch of things that are super interesting. So first of all, there are little kids that are born with a rare genetic disorder that's called, um, oh my gosh, I suddenly forgot the name of it. Oh, I cannot believe I forgot the name of it. Progeria. There we go. I was going to say porphyria. They rhyme. Um, progeria. Kids with progeria get old super fast. It's an incredibly tragic disease. Um, they get old really fast. They get Alzheimer's. They get strokes. They have heart attacks. They have arthritis. It's just a terrible disease. And they die usually of old age as teenagers. Well, we have not that recently discovered, fairly recently discovered, um, that they are born with short telomeres. And so that's why they're aging. All of their cells are going into senescence right off the bat. And so they grow old really fast. Um, another thing that's really interesting, when we clone animals, so the first mammal that we cloned um, was, I like saying we as though I had something to do with it. The first mammal we cloned was Dolly the sheep. And um, Dolly was cloned when she was seven years old. The average lifespan of a sheep of her type is around 14 years, give or take. So don't, don't quote me on that exactly, but roughly 14 years. So they clown, cloned, they didn't clone her, they cloned Dolly the sheep and her baby was born and lived for about seven years. Can you figure out why? So they used Dolly's DNA, but Dolly had already lived seven years. So her telomeres were shortened by seven years. So they took that DNA. They didn't really think about this or understand what was going on when they did this. So they took Dolly's shortened DNA and they put it into the egg of another um, sheep and that sheep gave birth to Dolly's clone, who was an infant, 
who was born with telomeres that were seven years short. So by the time that baby reached seven years of age, it had its cells entered senescence and then it died prematurely. How fascinating is that? Um, next thing, cancer cells. So, so let me back up. It is the shrinking telomeres that lead to senescence and why our, our cells can only divide about 50 times. That's called the hay flick limit. Um, and it just refers to how many, how long those telomeres are. And once they get too short, the cells can't divide anymore. However, cancer cells, we learn, can keep dividing and keep dividing. So what's interesting is that cancer cells have figured out how to turn on a gene for an enzyme that's called telomerase. Telomerase is an enzyme that protects this damage of the telomeres. So the telomeres stay long. They don't get any shorter. So cancer cells can beat the hay flick limit. They don't go into senescence. They can divide and divide and divide and divide. So the last thing that I think is super cool about this is well, why do we have the gene for telomerase? Like, why does it even exist in our DNA for cancer cells to turn it on? Well, it turns out there are some cells that do have to divide a lot of times. Your immune cells is one example. So when you're fighting off disease, your immune cells are dividing like crazy. They can't be held back by the Hayflick limit. So we have in our DNA the ability to, to protect our telomeres. So what if scientists could just turn that gene on in all of our cells and we protected all of our telomeres. Well, they've been able to do that in some organisms. They've been able to do that in like flatworms and I don't remember all of them. You could research it. It's fascinating. And they have unbelievably increased the lifespan of these organisms, just staggering longer lifespans. However, what is the inevitable outcome of increasing the number of cell divisions in a mammal. It always leads to cancer. And right now we can't cure cancer well enough to rationalize protecting our telomeres. So the telomeres protect us from cancer unless the cancer has turned on the telomerase gene. That's a mutation. Um, and so we can't really mess with it right now, but just a fascinating area of science. Okay, I think we're just about done here, everybody. Trying to see if there's anything else we need to talk about. Oh yeah, proofreading. This is super interesting. And then I think this is the last thing. So it says um, there's all kinds of different kinds of um, DNA polymerases. You don't really need to know them, but you might notice that some of them say like DNA polymerase and it has a Roman numeral three. Don't worry about it. There's just a bunch of them. So DNA polymerase three is responsible for elongation. It's the one that's copying the A's, T's, C's, and G's. Um, in, an, um, in a super simple cell, like an E. coli, a bacteria, it can travel at approximately 500 bases a second. So it's copying them 500 bases. Look how slow my hand is, 500 in a second. Unbelievable. In a eukaryotic cell, which is a little bit more complicated, DNA polymerase can copy about 50 bases a second. So initially, as it's going through, it makes an occasional mistake. About one in 10,000 pairs is mismatched. Um, but then, and that would be a problem. One in 10,000 doesn't sound like very much, but you have 3 billion letters in your A's, T's, of your A's, T's, C's, and G's. So that's a problem. This would create 300,000 mutations every time a human cell divided. That is too much. That leads to cancer. So we have all these proofreading enzymes that come through, and this is part of what P53 is triggering, is proofreading enzymes to come through and excise mutations and to replace them with the correct letters. So it says um, there are a series of other DNA polymerases and nucleases responsible for proofreading. Proofreading reduces the error rate to one in 10 billion nucleotides. So roughly less than one every three cell divisions. So very few mutations um, over time. But you know, as you get older and older, that's more and more and more that start to accrue. Okay, I believe that that is it, everybody. Let me know if you have any questions. Takes forever to shut this video down.
There we go. Now it's shutting down.